Hello and welcome back. My name is Seth Barres. We're going to be talking all about what's special about Kubernetes on Azure. I have Brendan Burns and Gabe, Monro Gabe Monroy. Sorry, it came out super fast. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Tell uh, us who you are and what you do. I already told you. Sure. I'm Brendan Burns. Um, I work uh, for Azure in a variety of different services, including the Azure Kubernetes service. I also help create the Kubernetes project um, and help still sort of run the governance of that and the CNCF as well. And so a lot of open source, a lot of cloud native. Fantastic. That's about it. Gabe? Yeah, I'm Gabe. I uh, lead the uh, product side of the Azure Container Compute team, so AKS, ACI, OpenShift Service. Uh, also sit on the board of the CNCF, where I do a lot of upstream uh, foundation open source work. Awesome. So I'll start out with the easy, maybe hard question. My producer back there, she's like, Seth, we talk about Kubernetes all the time. Can you just give me like the 10,000 foot, like, I want to talk to my grandparents about it. What is it? Sure. I mean, one of the ways I, I explain it is, um, you know, at this point, every computer out there has multiple cores. When you double click on an application to launch it, it's not like the computer pops up a dialogue and says, which core would you like to run this program on? It, it just finds one and runs it for you. You have an application you want to run. It's got resources to run those applications, takes care of it for you. And so Kubernetes is the same sort of thing, but for distributed systems across a large number of machines. So you I might see. have 10 or 100 machines. You have an application you want to run. Maybe you need 10 replicas of a front end, or you need uh, you know, middleware. You can declaratively say to Kubernetes, hey, I want there to be 10 replicas of this thing. Take care of it. It'll find the right machine to put it on. It'll run it. It'll create an Azure load balancer if it needs to. It will mount disks if it needs to. Um, it just sort of takes care of you declaring the state of the world that you want to see. And, uh, and it'll take care of the execution for you, as well as the, the healing of it. So. Um, one of the other stories I tell to kind of explain it, and this, you said earlier, distributed systems uh, you know, are hard. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, and, and when I was a kid, um, I, went and I, I spent probably six months building this balsa model airplane, you know, remote control thing. Took it down to the park, ready to go, fire up the engine. 15 seconds up into the air, down into oh, the concrete, no. explodes, right? My kids, iPad and a drone, they're flying it around the house, right, with an iPad, no skills. And that's Kubernetes, right? Like, it, it is an online system that is like this, the intelligence that keeps your application running successfully. It makes it easier for you to build your application. You know, uh, so that, that's, that's the other piece of it. It's like it, we use automation in all of these places to make our lives easier. Kubernetes is a system to make distributed systems easier to run. That's awesome. So I'm going to ask another question that may seem counterintuitive to everyone watching, but I think it's important to ask this. When should you not use Kubernetes? Because I feel like sure. everyone's like, Kubernetes all the things, and I feel like, is that something that you would suggest? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really important. I mean, a couple of different things there. Um, one is, if you're happy with the way you're building and deploying software to the cloud, like, don't change. Yeah. You know, it's like, don't, don't do resume-driven development. Um, you know, <laughs> That's a that, good point, resume RSS. Resume, you don't want to do resume-driven <laughs> development. R RTS, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so if you're really happy with it, Stick with whatever it is that, that's working for you, whether it's a high-level service like app services or functions, or it's raw, low-level VMs. Like if, if you're happy with the, your ability to deploy software, your reliability, productivity of developers, you know, stick with it. Um, I think Kubernetes has been built to solve some pain that we saw people having. Um, but if you don't have any of that pain, then like, and it's not, there's no point. So can you specify what the pain yeah, might yeah, be? Yeah, so you know, one, other, one other thing I'd, I'd point out is, uh, Kubernetes has a, a really good set of features for doing microservice-based development. And oftentimes, when I talk to customers and they're like, yeah, we're doing microservices, I look a little closer at the workloads, I'm like, actually, that's two websites, right? And, and so it, you know, uh, there's this tendency to want to like, make a system more complicated than it needs to be. And you know, we've got great products like you know, Azure Web Apps and you know, App Services uh, uh, you know, to run those simple workloads. And I try to advise customers to use the simplest possible product to get the job done. Right. Um, and oftentimes, that's not Kubernetes. Yeah, for sure. And so the situation then arises where you're using the simple services that get the job done when all of a sudden they stop getting the job done. When it, can you give me the smells for when the, stop, the job stops getting done? That might be a good use case for Kubernetes. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of different, there's a lot of different axes on which that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think you can look at something like the uh, CADA announcement, the Kubernetes event-driven uh, auto-scaling announcement we did today, which enables you to run Azure Functions code on top of a Kubernetes cluster, um, you might need to run that function suddenly on-prem. 
you might need to run that function in an edge situation on a Raspberry Pi cluster. And, and Azure obviously you know, may not be able to go to a four node Raspberry Pi cluster, sure. but you can use Kubernetes there to orchestrate your Azure function. Um, and so you can take the same code and run it in both places, right? So we, now we've, the place where Azure Functions you know, fell down, if you will, is, is in that tiny little on-prem environment. Um, sometimes it's around flexibility, right? And so it's around the fact that uh, a PaaS platform may say like, hey, you can't write to disk. You know, that's not something that we let you do, right? Um, and you need to say, oh, no, actually, I need that, I need that ability. And in those worlds, you know, I think one of the things we're seeing is more and more people are having sort of an ejection path mm -hmm. so that you can take the code that was in a more platform as a service and turn it into a container and then run it in something like Kubernetes. Um, and more and more interop, too. So you know, app service, you can put it in a VNet. Kubernetes can be in the same VNet. Maybe you can make the two services talk to each other. I see. So, yeah, yeah, well, yeah one, one other example I point out is when you have services that need to call other services, right? That example that I showed before about two websites you know, doing static serving, there's not a lot of inner communication, right? But when you actually have services calling other services inside of a compute platform, that's where some of the features around Kubernetes, like service discovery and you know, the you know, DNS and the, uh, the networking model inside of Kubernetes really start to make it easier uh, to you know, uh, construct those more complex environments. Yeah, and I think the other piece that I would say is um, the ecosystem that we see, have seen grown up mean that you know, it's become sort of the lingua franca for deploying stuff, right? right? And so it, you know, it's one thing if you're deploying your own software, but let's say you want to use software that another, you know, another open source project is creating or a startup is creating. You know, the way they're going to package and that is as a Helm chart that deploys onto Kubernetes, because that way their software has the broadest reach. You can run it on Azure, you can run it on-prem, you can run it on other clouds. So sometimes it's not necessarily about the specifics of deploying the software. It's actually about the fact that this platform will go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, the next question I have, and this I've heard a lot, with distributed systems, it's always hard with two things, storage and networking. Yeah. How does Kubernetes help with that? Um, well, I think in, in networking is the obvious one where it helps a lot, because we built in a lot of integration with load balancing and cloud load balancers and routing between applications. We gave every, every application in the cluster has its own IP address. You know, so you're not doing weird port forwarding stuff and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's a place where we do a lot of help. Storage is harder. I mean, there is a bunch of modeling of storage. But even in Kubernetes, I think we would suggest if you can use a managed storage service, if you can use a Cosmos DB or an Azure SQL, that's a great choice. right? Um, and even if you can't, if you're on-prem, you know, get a team to focus on running storage for you. You know, get a team to focus on running a database as a, you know, as a service for your company or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of work, actually, people have done, HashiCorp and Console have, have done a bunch of work to make it easy for you to maybe take a database running in an on-prem or even a, just a VM and integrate it with a Kubernetes cluster. I see. Right? Which brings us to the next question, right? And I think this is a natural follow. What makes Kubernetes special on Azure. I know there was a lot of innovations that happened, like virtual kubelets, for example, that happened because of the stuff that we're working on. Tell me how Azure is making Kubernetes special. Well, I think one of the most interesting things is, you know, Brendan got up on stage at KubeCon in Shanghai, uh, the last KubeCon event, and talked about how the future of Kubernetes is serverless, and sort of painted the picture of, you know, this world where you could have a Kubernetes portable API, uh, where the containers were running on a serverless backend, build per second, hypervisor isolated, no virtual machines to manage. Uh, but still, you know, through that same Kubernetes API that the community and the ecosystem is, 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 is backing up. Now, you know, today, uh, and actually at, at Build, we've now GA'd support for what we call AKS virtual nodes, which is the productization of, of this feature. And so really excited, you know, a lot of folks in retail, for example, take a look at the speed with which you can do auto scaling on top of something like virtual nodes. Because if you, if you think about it, you know, when you have a load event, having to spin up and manage capacity at the VM layer dynamically yeah, it's a problem. while your customers are yeah. you know, waiting for page loads, you know, slow page loads to, to you know, become faster, that's a problem, right? And being able to burst directly to the Azure Compute Fabric, which is what uh, Azure Container Instances offers, um, is really, really compelling for a lot of use cases. So let me yeah. see if I understand this feature, because I, 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 I'm just hearing this now. I know the announcement was yesterday, was it? Yeah. Uh, Basically, what you're doing is you're having the control plane be something that Azure 
you, you start up in Azure, but then everything else just sort of happens. Am I getting this right? Well, I mean, it, it's the containers themselves are running on the Azure fabric instead of running on virtual machines. Got it. Right? So you don't see a virtual machine anywhere. You just see your container running. And it's good for this burst stuff. It's also actually honestly good for a bunch of enterprises we talked to because they no longer have to worry about the operating system as a, a layer that they have to manage and secure. You know, we are securing the operating system for them. They just worry about the application that's going inside of the container. So you know, we can wow. provide you know, regulatory certification and other kinds of security there, patching and upgrades and all that sort of stuff. And that's nice um, for me as a developer, because I, like, if I build my container, I just hear. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and as a developer, if you build your container and launch it, and there's no VM, central IT isn't going to come along and be like, what's up with that VM and why didn't you, because you know, there is no VM for them to introspect. So it's easier for everybody. You so know? When, you, when you do that, though, is it still like you still have this virtual private environment as well? Yeah, so the, I mean, a, the ACI, the Azure Container Instances, run in, they can run on the public internet, but they can also run in a VNet, in, a, in your private network. And, I see. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. That's um, interesting. I, I want to point out another thing that we, um, that we actually also launched here at Build, um, which is support for policy uh, in AKS. Um, and this is actually another collaboration with an open source project. Um, to develop the engine for policy enforcement for Kubernetes. Um, but then we've taken it and made it a part of the AKS product. So just like you can do Azure policy for Azure, you can use the Kubernetes policy to make rules. Like say, for example, whenever you create a load balancer with a public IP address, you need to also attach a, secure, a ticket for your security review. You, know, you need to make sure that if you're going to put something on the public internet, the security team's taken a look and made sure you're doing the right things, right? if you want to make sure that you only pull from certain registries. From, obviously, we are now maybe not, have always known that running binaries from the internet was a bad idea. <laughs> right. Um, you want to make sure your cluster only pulls from your private Azure Container Registry. Policy is the way that you can enforce that, not just on a single cluster, but actually for an entire subscription or an entire tenant. And that's, that's um, like a new part of the control plane then? It's, it's sort of in the middle. You can think, it's called Gatekeeper, actually, okay. which is, describes exactly what it does. So you as the developer come and say, I want you to create this. And Gatekeeper is sort of the auditor who looks at that API automatically, obviously not a person, looks at that API, introspects it, applies a bunch of rules. If it passes, lets it in. If it doesn't pass, rejects it to you and says, hey, you need to have put a tag on it that was your contact email address or whatever else, right? Yeah, so, and, and I want to hone in on, on cool. something that Brendan said, which, which was that, you know, in order to solve this problem, we decided that it was important that we did it in the open source community first, right? And so we had, you know, part of our team just go try and figure out how to solve policy concerns for Kubernetes anywhere. Uh, that project turned into a project called Gatekeeper that's now in the CNCF. And then we went and built product on that. And we got the great fancy portal experience and, and, and you know, great, some great work with the Azure policy team. Um, so really excited to see that model of development where we go upstream first, get the you know, buy-in from the community, and then you know, bring that sort of enterprise friendliness uh, to you know, Microsoft and Azure customers. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out, get contributions from the community too, right? The yep. policy language that you use is this language called Rego mm -hmm. that was developed by a, an, an open source startup. And we get to take advantage of all the thought that went into designing that language for specifying these policies. Um, and so you know, I, I think it's, there's a a give and a take relationship where they had a language, we figured out how to marry it up with Kubernetes, and then we turned it into a product in AKS. And that is the ideal way you work with open source. In my That's mind. cool. So we have about a minute left. What, if you have customers out, what do you want to tell them? What's the best thing to do if they want to get started with Kubernetes on Azure? What should they do? You know, we have a learning path that we just published, uh, and the learning path is, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, a very structured set of steps from, uh, you know, just what are the basics. Uh, Brendan did a lot of lightboard uh, exercises, recorded videos to That's help cool. that. Um, also a lot of guided trainings, uh, and, you know, really can get you up and running and, and familiar with Kubernetes through a set of structured learning modules. I um, definitely recommend ch uh, checking that out. I believe it's aka.ms slash AKS learning path. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a, and we'll get the links on, uh, out there for people. Uh, it's hard to click on a video. Yeah, uh, you can, <laughs> but we don't feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would also say, you know, there's a lot of really great community resources out there too, um, from local meetups to uh, the Kubernetes.io. There's a lot of great um, resources out there for you, um, as well as uh, you know books that people have written. Awesome. Myself included. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for watching. We're here at the Microsoft Build Live stage for Microsoft Build 2019. Thank you for watching and we'll see you after the break.